One of the big questions I have as a coach and a player is, can everyone improve by studying their own games? And is that truly the best method? If you've been following my videos, you know I've been saying that for years, that the path to improvement is to study your own games. Now, the difficulty with that statement is that it's so hard for people to study their own games that the rate of failure is incredible. Now, one uh, bonus for me of the chess boom has been that instead of raising my rates as a teacher, I do this hardcore thing where I'm like, well, if, if I'm not convinced you're going to do the work on your own of analyzing your own games, then I'm not interested as a in having you as a student. I have too many students, right? So that's actually given me the ability to really press this uh, pedagogy out into the world. And I'm doing it here too, where I'm not going to look at a game uh, unless I feel like you've done some real work thinking about it. And you can see when I do these game review videos, you can I always show the notes that the player did. And I don't care what level you are as a player, as long as you are working on it. And Ricker's been doing it for a while now and uh, really improving steadily his uh, ability to write and think about his games. Um, one thing that's interesting about Ricker, just everybody's got their own circumstance is that he's an older dude and he is you know trying to learn and enjoy chess at, a, at an older age and it's of course difficult because especially with things like tactics it's possible to really lose the game immediately to have an accident so uh, what I'm hoping to do in this video is to uh, go into two areas where I want Ricker to improve his game analysis. And I'm hoping that people watching this video will think to themselves, oh right, um, I can do this myself and it's helpful if I submit a game to say to this channel to do a, a review or to have a coach, somebody look at it to give me some sense of like what's going on uh, in my thinking and the way I'm writing about the game. So let's get into it and um, here we go. So, Ricker, you are doing fine, man. You are doing fine up until this point. We can argue about this and that and the other thing, but it's great. Now, e5, beautiful move, and it's white now who pushes the position into a little bit of a crisis with d5. Now, I can tell you you're going to be doing great no matter what move you make here. Um, but what I want you to do Okay, I want two things. Here are the two things that I want you to do when you um, do your next annotations. First of all, as you saw in his notes, he's doing it finally at the board instead of it uh, on the computer screen. Two things. I want you, the, the position's going to change now, and you're the one who gets to decide because you can play 97 or EF. They honestly both look good. I think one's better than the other, but they both look good. And to try to describe, this is of area number one, where I want improvement, is try to describe what the dynamic of the position is in terms of just peace placement and activity, okay? That's area number one. And number two, to try to be better about writing out variations. One thing I've known, I know about you from having looked at your games for a while is that you are of a poetic turn of mind, and that's fine. That's fine, but you still want, we, we want you to be grounded in some variations, right? Like, you know, you like the flowery language, which honestly sometimes is very good for understanding how chess works. Okay, so you, th I, you make what I think is the correct, very, uh, correct um, uh, choice, and you do this. Okay, now one of the things that I want you to write about, let's put on, go ahead and take this pawn is there's some things in here that I feel like you're not seeing in terms of how great your own position is here. So I'm gonna put it in words, and these are the kinds of things that I want you to talk about. Later in your notes, you refer to this as a terrible pawn. I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. It's cutting this knight's activity from the game. And in particular, I want you to see that this bishop, that's kind of nasty. 
and it's also hitting this guy, not great. And this knight also doesn't know what to do. And one of the reasons it doesn't know what to do is your magnificent unopposed bishop now on this diagonal. So um, you're doing absolutely fantastic. That's a good move. And I think that is a bad move from your opponent um, because right away, uh, white should be thinking, oh, black's about to undermine my dark squares completely with a move like rook b8. So he should probably play rook c1 followed by b3, something like that. Okay, and now here's your crime. All right, here's your first crime, and it's really important to see. Let's read what you wrote, because you took this and read what you wrote. Now I'm not so sure. How much do I have to worry about my stranded pawn on c6? He has two pawns hanging, right? Okay, well, look, let's think about it. That bishop, oh, man, Ricker broke, broke my heart, man, that you took that knight. It broke my heart that you took the knight. The bishop is so strong, you will never get mated with that bishop there because you control all the dark squares around your king, and the knight is truly dominated by this pawn. And the way you're doing here is, well, you're thinking that pawns are people and taking that knight. Now, are you still better after this? Probably. But with a move like rook b8, the guy's, the guy's in big trouble. I think, I think it's lost, honestly, totally gone. He can't play, he can't move the pawn on b2. Okay, so that's the kind of thinking we want. And now bishop e6. And what we want for variations is um, just imagining like what would have been better for white. And so, for example, in this position after bishop e6, I'm assuming queen d4 is now a very nice centralizing move for white where he talks to all the dark squares. And it's a good example of how you know, as the game progresses, the queen more and more wants to come to the center squares, you know, to dominate everybody from the middle. So, right, some kind of weird attack. We don't know. Thank you. Now, notice with this move, h6, is the knight really doing anything on f3? No, no. So you could play queen f6, for example, here, or rook b8. All right, goes back. Good, and, and a weird move, okay? Weird move. Um, now you should probably play g5, okay? But, okay, you're still doing good. Now it's, it does get a little scary. And now bishop e6, knight c6, okay. Now, one of the things I want you to see, Ricker, is that in the next couple moves, it feels like you don't know what to do, so you go for a cheap mate on g2. Instead, I want you to think about improving the position. There's a variety of ways you could do so. Your queen is at the moment protecting the king fine. So for example, let's say bishop d7 followed by rook e8 or rook, you know, one of the rooks there first. Great, I love it. Uh, you could definitely consider also just taking the pawn on c3, you're doing fine. That's cheap. <laughs> That's cheap, Ricker. He might not fall for it. And if he doesn't, well, then you're the one who has troubles. Now, now you have to take it with your beautiful bishop. And now, as you found out in the game, you had some light square troubles. Okay. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of this move. I'm just going to say I'm not a fan. Um, and, but it is a little bit difficult, and I wanted you to do something more like rook a e8. So why is this a problem? Because bishop takes, pawn takes, rook takes, he's threatening rook g4, and your king is weak. A nice thing to just say out loud is, hey, in a late middle game with the heavies on, the heavies being the queen and rook, we want to, the, the, the value of the um, king safety really explodes because the king can really get in trouble. King safety is always important, but in the heavy middle game, it's especially important, or late, you know, late middle game. Um, these are the kinds of things I want you to learn to say out loud to yourself while you're analyzing the game. So he, I don't know what he's doing, okay? And then now a really weird thing happens, really weird. Rook takes, whoa, <laughs> whoa, Ricker, that's his exchange, boss. He needs to be taking that thing with a bishop. No one knows. And then you took it back with a rook. 
I don't know. Just take it with the pawn, man. Just take it with the pawn. Why would you? Why and why do you need to take the bishop? You're doing fine. There's not even a, he's not even threatening anything. Doing fine. Ah. Okay. Okay. Four. King G7. I don't get it, Ricker. I don't get it. Um, so these are the kinds of positions I want you to think about what uh, you what the improvements might be. So, for example, Rook B8 looks like a good move. Fix the Rook. Okay, this happens. Bad move on his part. Thank you very much. H3. Okay. Rook E8. King H2. No one understands. Rook E8. Good. And now, here you blunder, Ricker. And this is what I was mentioning earlier about the question of, like, y y you know, your circumstance. And I think as an older dude, and this is certainly true for myself, uh, it is much easier to blunder. So you need to tell yourself when you're going over games like this that, oh, right, this is a problem of mine that I have to be more aware of. And I think that trying to be very diligent about writing out variations will help you. Like, to be more diligent about thinking about basics like, oh, if he goes there, I'm going to go there kind of variations. And here it was kind of interesting, I thought, psychologically, that, you know, you write out that rookie two happened. Uh, but you weren't able to put it into the game score. So it's kind of a, a Freudian thing, I guess. Okay, so let me just try to finish it with this final thought. Um, I'd like to believe, or I, I believe pretty strongly in my philosophy of game improvement. It's not, one of the things about it is it's very non-commercial in the sense that like something like Chessable you know, you have to pay some money, and Chessable's going to make some money on you by selling you the idea of Chessable. Now, Chessable might be kind of cool. I, I, I know it's not for 1600s to be like going over deep game, a deep opening analysis. I know that's not going to help them, but that's what they're selling, and it's like kind of cool and it's flashy and yada yada. Whereas this takes a lot of work, and really is, I think, the way to improvement. And it's like, you know. I'm not really selling it, and I'm not selling like there's no monetary value for me when you, you know, start setting your own games. It's just the path that I found that worked for myself, and I know is the let's call it the Soviet, old school path as well. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there, and soon I'm going to talk about some of our friends who have similar problems. Why well, not similar? Not similar to Ricker, but problems of using the fancy technology uh, to do things way beyond their current skill level and needs uh, instead of doing this. And, you know, the, the image I had in my head recently was like, I, I saw some video of a this heroin addict on the streets of LA, man. He looked rough, dude. He hadn't, he hadn't taken a shower in a long time. And dude asked him like, hey, do uh, you think you're ready to quit? And he's like, uh, no, the, the high's too good, man. <laughs> the high's too good. I think I got to let it ride for a little while, at least a little while longer. And that's how I, I think is going on with a lot of people doing the chessable and the blitz, especially. Okay, until next time. Bye-bye.